of government lackeys who say you didn't build that are you tired of elitists who think you need a government permission slip for everything everything you do is an a to b conversation and the government should see their way out of it create true free markets by adopting the bipcot no government license the bipcot no gov license allows user modification of any product service or software except by governments or government agents go to bipcot.org that's bravo india papa charlie oscar tango.org
everybody, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on theconsciousresistance.com and theseedsofliberty.com. So Peaceful Anarchism is covered by the BIPCOT NoGov license. This allows reuse for by anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information for that at BIPCOT.org. So today I have uh, Catherine Bleich, uh, who's coming in from Texas. She's the... Um, the, can I say wife or partner or, or, what, or John? What, what do you want me to say? <laughs> we're married, not right. legally, uh, but yeah. we're married. I'm uh, his wife. Okay, wife. Cool. Okay, <laughs> okay. So, wife of John, yeah. the the illustrious John Bush, uh, and uh, and they're and they're both massively into freedom, which is awesome. So she's coming in from Texas, and so she's a volunteerist, uh, unschooler, peaceful parent, and is the part owner of Brave New Books. Uh, that's their bookstore. Uh, then, so you can find out information for that at bravenewbookstore.com. And also you can find out articles that she will be posting on <laughs> thehomestead.guru. Uh, her and Alma will be talking about her um, the, the, uh, the road trip that they're going to take with their Bitcoin bus uh, called Dash Across America in the Bitcoin bus. Um, so you can find out on Facebook, uh, her page is uh, one is Brave New Books. And then her, Facebook, her, 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 her page is uh, Catherine Elizabeth Bleich. Or her personal profile is just Catherine Bleich. Uh, and also uh, Bitcoin.com bus. Look out for that. And on Twitter, the Bitmom. And on Instagram, uncoinventional. So she's definitely unconventional. Um, but uh, <laughs> so we're going to talk about, you know, maybe uh, what it's like raising undocumented or sovereign children. Um, and about her road trip. Tell us all about that. And, uh, and about her stateless marriage. You don't hear that too often. Really cool. I love it. And, uh, and about her unschooling and peaceful parenting style. So, um, Catherine, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. No problem. Yeah, I, uh, I uh, met John uh, Liberty Fest. I think it was last year. And I was lucky to get a, a quick 15-minute interview while his kids, or your kids, were, <laughs> were playing under the, uh, under the, uh, the table. <laughs> And they gave us 50 minutes of golden free time. I know I'm a parent of two. I know how precious free time is. So I took it. And then when he had to go, that's it. It was done. But I was so happy. I got 15 minutes with the guy. So good. <laughs> that's awesome. You guys are hard. The, to the, uh, those conferences are really hard with the kids. It's like we're working a vendor booth. We're giving speeches. And there's like, ah! <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, you, you were lucky to get 15 straight minutes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, I give you guys a lot of... Uh, a lot of props for doing all that, for, you know, going to these different venues and speaking. And, you know, that's really awesome. Um, you're doing what you can to bring about, um, you know, volunteerism and uh, and peaceful parenting and unschooling. And that's a beautiful thing. So I think we all do our part, right? <laughs> um, so please uh, tell us a little bit of maybe about your background um, real quick about how you got into volunteerism and all this stuff and unschooling and peaceful parenting. And then we'll go from there. Sure. So I, I guess I was more of a, a lefty type in college, you know, um, I've been a vegetarian since 2003, anti-war, anti-Bush, did all that. Um, I actually sat on the board of directors for a local United Nations association in Santa Barbara, California, which is funny because someone made a YouTube video about me saying exposing Catherine Blige, and it's like, she's on the board of a UN chapter. It's like, yeah, I thought I was doing good, you know? And I learned about Ron Paul, and I actually started wearing my Ron Paul sticker to my UN meetings. <laughs> and they're like, you know, he doesn't like us. And I'm like, why? So I started learning more and more about Dr. Ron Paul. I got really involved in his 2008 presidential campaign. I was actually a delegate to the RNC in 2008. And that was when I realized that politics was a fraud. <laughs> that was when I realized that even... The good doctor is going to sell out for, you know, the, the amount of power that he wants and the roles in government that he would like to be seated in. And that was when I realized that my role as a delegate from the state of Missouri was nothing more than a television extra on a set for a giant television production. And, I mean, honestly, we had um, chant cards, you know, that we were given and we were told – you know, you, you chant this this many times after this speaker. Don't go over because we have to do a hard commercial break. So, I mean, we were literally extras on a television set. Wow. And so for me, that, that was sort of my catapult 
toward anarchism. I didn't really understand what anarchism was. I hadn't really been introduced to it. And then I went to Porkfest in 2009. And, you know, we, I, I've done a bunch of fusion center activism and things at, at this point in time. And all these people at Porkfest were talking about minarchism and anarchism. And I'm just sitting there like, wow, you know, this is mind blowing. And so the next year, 2010, I realized that I was an anarchist while I was on stage giving a rant for Soapbox Idol. And halfway through the rant, I'm just like, I'm a mother effing anarchist. <laughs> and it was just like this thing that came to me. And, you know, so it really took me kind of two years to really deprogram this whole, like, I'm going to be a Republican and I'm going to change the world through, you know, this political empire. I did the whole tea party thing, got kicked out of them because they asked me if I was a 9-11 truther. And I said, well, I don't know. Ron Paul doesn't let us talk about it. So I never looked into it, looked into it. <laughs> yeah, I guess I am. They're like, okay, you're done with us. And I'm like, well, where do I belong? Hmm. And that was really when I found y'all, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the voluntarists, the anarchists, the um, nonviolent communicators, the peaceful uh, parents. This is when I really started finding the people that I really fit in with. And I believe that the Free State Project and the Porcupine Freedom Festival really is what year after year, I went seven years in a row, is really what exposed me to the community aspect of this and made me realize that this is this is bigger than a political movement. This is a lifestyle. And this is something that we can pass down to our children and that we can truly step into and become. It's not just something we talk about. It's not something we try to convince others to do. It's something that we are innately when we're born. And so to regress that sort of wild nature that, you know, I am a free, sovereign human being was a really beautiful process for me. And um, my husband and I sort of ended up going on that journey together. I was in Missouri. He was in Texas. We found each other in Chicago. We love it in, for instant first sight. And, you know, our, our path of kind of depoliticking evolved simultaneously. And, and sometimes I'm further evolved than he is philosophically. And sometimes he's further evolved than I am philosophically or spiritually or, or logically or whatever it is. And we've had this kind of tug and pull with each other that's been really beautiful. Um, you know, like with Bitcoin, um, I could not get him to help me set up a Bitcoin wallet for pork chest four years ago. Hmm. And so I bartered someone a whole slaughtered chicken to help me do it. <laughs> and so, you know, like he was, he just was too busy. I can't do it. We were doing silver. Why do we need Bitcoin? And it's like, it's worth $3 already. Oh my gosh. I've got to get in on this right now. You know, <laughs> the next year it was worth <laughs> the next year it was worth 12 and then the next year it was worth 125 and you know and so um now he does a podcast all about bitcoin and our life's all around bitcoin so um it, it's been a really neat evolution and so right now i'm a parent of a four-year-old and a three-year-old and a, a business owner and um we tried to be full on agorist for a while and decided to buy a bookstore and it's just been a wild ride, really, and we're on a journey still, and we're evolving and changing, and I'm, I'm sure a year from now I'll have a total, totally different perspective on life. Mm -hmm. um, but, but right now, this is where I am, and, and that's where I came from. Yeah, that's that's so awesome. Such an awesome journey. I love I love to hear how people um, come to this philosophy. You know, we all come from our own different uh, unique backgrounds. You know, I came from... Uh, Democratic family, but I didn't really care about politics. I was more indifferent to politics. And, you know, I voted for Obama. You know, we all have our sins. <laughs> uh, I, voted, I voted for Obama in 2008, not because I care about Obama, but because uh, my mom was like, you got to vote. I'm like, all right, who should I vote for? We're Democrats. Vote for Obama. All right, I'll vote for Obama. <laughs> and then yes, mom. Yes, mom. Yeah, I didn't really care about it. And then later on, I kind of realized that I got into, you know, a creature from Jekyll Island and Murray Rothbard books, you know, um, Case for the uh, case for the hundred percent gold dollar, uh, anatomy of the state, uh, um, what has government done to our money, <coughs> and then Larkin Rose and a couple of other awesome books like that. So really got me, and then Stefan Molyneux, that was a big one, you know, all of his videos and stuff. And so uh, really got me thinking about volunteerism and simultaneously peaceful parenting 
and unschooling because um, it seems natural, I think, for you and me, maybe, uh, you know, volunteerism, unschooling, peaceful parenting. But for so many people, it's not like it's amazing how many, you know, how many volunteers you meet that are not, um, uh, let's say, peaceful parenters in the way that we are. But and, and it's like you really have to come to each of these little philosophies separately and understand them separately, even though they are intertwined. Right. Um, but yes, but, yes, but, absolutely. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I've, I, I've witnessed that so, so many places all over the country where people um, maybe they're introduced to one aspect, whether it's the financial aspect or the political aspect. And they think they have found the golden nugget and they mm. kind of stop there. It's like, hold on a second. Hold on a second. You know, if yeah. if you are acting as the state at home, your children are going to enact that out in public, whether they are the oppressors or the oppressed, you know, whether mm. they're the cop who's aggressing upon someone or they're just complying because, you know, we, we all have to comply with cops. Right. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you know, I, I think it's really important that as people who are, you know, discussing these things in a public forum, that we make sure that we stay curious ourselves and that we remember that, you know, there is no golden nugget. There is no one answer. And all of these things are overlapped and intertwined in a really beautiful way. And, um, you know, the, the next the next thing for me, maybe spirituality or, you know, gardening was a big thing for a while for me. Mm. So it's like there's always these new things that not only do we have to introduce ourselves to and expose ourselves to and consider and reflect on, but sometimes we have to revisit them if we start to slip away from them mm. because of our day to day hectic lives. Yeah, yeah, and one uh, common theme that I notice amongst anarchists and volunteers, especially, is um, the willingness to question previously held beliefs, right, and place everything on the chopping block of logic and reason, right. And uh, not many people are that humble, right, because people are like, "Well, this is what I've been taught since I was young, and this is what I'm going to believe." <laughs> and uh, and I re- yes, I, yes, and I highly respect people who do that because it's not easy to re-examine things that you've always believed. Right. It's not easy to change belief systems or, um, you know, learn new things. Learning is hard. You know, it's not for, it's not easy. <laughs> you know, it's just easier to, to just hold cling, you know, emotionally most of the time to old uh, irrelevant beliefs. You know, that's the easiest. And the, so so I, I, I noticed that with a lot of volunteers, they're very humble. Most most of them very humble about that, because in order to get here, most of us haven't grown up in a volunteer's household. So you had to question your beliefs. Right. So, um, yes. So I, I love that. You know, I, I love that idea of, uh, of willingness to learn uh, new things and grow and develop. Right. And, uh, and one thing that I also learned a lot is Bitcoin, but I think you guys know <laughs> more than me. I'd like to get more into it. I, I do have a, a wallet. I have, um, Airbits. I used to have, uh, well, I was on blockchain, uh, dot info, I think. And then, and then I, last year in the Liberty Fest, there's the Airbits people that were there, and they were talking. They were saying, "No, no, no! Blockchain is horrible. Get on Airbits." So I got, <laughs> so I got Airbits. <laughs> That's pretty cool. I like it. It's very, very, very sleek. You know, app on my phone, and you know, with the uh, finger, um, you know, touch, you know, uh, passcode, right, with your, just your finger, and um, yeah, it's very easy to use. So that, that's what you guys use, right? Well, and. Yeah, and, and one of the most beautiful parts about the Airbits wallet is that it has an interactive map on it, similar to Google Maps, except it only shows you places that accept Bitcoin. So if you're new to the cryptocurrency world and you're like, okay, so what am I going to do with this Bitcoin that I just spent three weeks trying to figure out how to buy? <laughs> yeah. Like now that I have it, what do I do? Well, the Airbits wallet will show you the places in your neighborhood or you know anywhere across the globe that accept Bitcoin and it makes it really easy to just show up And it also allows you to, um, with the touch of a button, say, I would like to receive Bitcoin. How much? You type in the amount in either dollars or Bitcoin. And then you hand your phone over for someone to scan the QR code or you send an email to them. So, you know, for John and I, when we're doing um, business and we need to, you know, send an invoice um, for Bitcoin payment, we just use the Bitcoin app on, or excuse me, the Airbits app on our bookstore tablet and we can email an invoice in about 10 seconds. <laughs> and, and it's, there's no copying and pasting of the, of the Bitcoin address or the QR code. It's just type in the dollar amount of what we mean and type in their email address and boom, 
they have a QR code to scan in their email and it makes it very easy. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, when I talk to people about Bitcoin, um, it's, it's kind of interesting the, the things that people know. Most people, all they know is what they've seen on the, you know, mainstream news. Um, and usually when they do report Bitcoin, it's like, you know, Mount Gox collapsed. You know, there was this many Bitcoins that were stolen. This many got hacked. <laughs> you know, like that's the kind yeah. of news that people hear. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. And it's so funny to me because it's like there are no... Um, central kind of giant banks that are collapsing because the government is subsidizing and, you know, giving them these giant bailouts. So when people bring that up to me, I'm like, well, yeah, because we're, th this is a, an honest money. And so if someone is doing something corrupt, like Mt. Gox was, they are going to fail. There is no one too big to fail in Bitcoin. Mm. And that is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. I love it that Mt. Gox failed. Yeah. Heck, Yes, fail away <laughs> because that keeps us pure. It keeps us honest. And it really, in my opinion, shows that the free market works. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, yeah, the, the point that I make when they, when they mention that is, um, you know, when, when a, a thief, uh, you know, steals money from a bank, do you blame the dollars? <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly. And how how many people are pickpocketed on a daily basis, either electronically or physically? I mean, money is robbed. Right, people are going right. to steal anything that you have, whether it's Bitcoin or the shirt off your back. Like a thief is a thief is a thief. Yeah. And you don't blame the shirt. You don't blame the, blame the currency. You, you, you need to blame the thief. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I mean, j just like anything, Bitcoin is a uh, you know it's it's a creation, it's invention, it's a technology, uh, it's an inanimate object basically. Even if it's not if it's not physical, like you know, like a computer, like a gun, like a car, and like all of those things, which are tools, um, depends on who's using it and for what reason they're using it. Right? Could be used for good or for evil. And so you can never you never blame the tool, right? You always blame the user, the person. Like if, you, if the computer, you know, malfunctions, you blame the computer or the comp or the programmer, <laughs> right? That's right. <laughs> so, so that's why I, I like to uh, I like to bring it bring it back to you know help people to realize that you know this is just this is just a tool that people use like a computer like a car you know you can use it for many many different things but you can't blame it for things you can't blame it for failure. <laughs> and, and the beautiful that's thing right. is the that's beautiful thing is right. the beautiful thing is that people are not forced to use it. People are using it because they love it. It's efficient. It's quick. It's easy. And they're not they don't have to be forced to use it, right? Everybody's forced to use Federal Reserve notes, you know, to to transact for the most part, to pay their taxes, if they do pay taxes. Um and they have to be forced. So what does that tell you about the quality of Federal Reserve notes? <laughs> well, and it's such an archaic and outdated system. You know, when John and I accept credit card payments at the bookstore, it takes forever for us to get that money. Like if if you use a credit card on a Friday even though we pay $25 a month for next day deposit, we don't get that money until Tuesday. Okay. Whoa. With Bitcoin, I get it instantly. Right. You know, so it's like, like it's, it's, I have the ability to, because especially when you're a small business and sometimes the cash flow is very tight, like very, very tight, and you can't restock the things that people buy until you have that money in your account. And then at that point, you still have to send them the money and they have to ship you the product. And so, you know, every now and again, when when cash flow is really tight, we go out of stock on stuff that we really shouldn't. And part of that is because of how slow and archaic the banking system is. And I do believe that they will be catching up and I do believe that they will be using cryptocurrencies. Um, you know, I've, I've got a family member who's on the board of a Federal Reserve Bank in the Midwest. And, wow. you know, he said that they are doing yeah yeah he's, he's the president of a bank and wow. they 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 are doing um in-depth research on bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and how it can be utilized to make their transactions faster and so here we are with this amazing cutting edge technology you know teaching the giant dinosaur how to catch up <laughs> like, we're going around you we're going over you we're going under you and if you want to participate in our new money and our new economy you need to catch up and so now they are being forced to step up and learn about what we are doing and you know because you can't force us to stay in that world anymore it is just so outdated and so 
it's 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 ridiculous to me <laughs> that I <laughs> that I still have to wait four days to get a deposit of of money that was spent on a Friday. You know, that's absurd. It's absolutely ridiculous. And so I think we're gonna see in the next ten years um, you know, a, a very strong movement toward cryptocurrency becoming very mainstream and um whether it's bitcoin that stays through the through the long term i don't know i do know there are banks in europe that are testing um, ethereum and ether and using their open source technology to test their own interbank to bank transactions so um i think we're, we're in a really interesting time where the the old model and the new way they're sort of merging and um i'm excited to see what happens i think it's it's going to be neat you know that's such a that's such a very strange situation like federal reserve officials <laughs> investigating bitcoin it's like it's like criminals in investigating how to make their crimes more efficient. <laughs> That's kind of what brings it to mind to me. <laughs> it's like, wow, you guys are so efficient in your transactions. Maybe I should use that in my crime. Hmm, that would make my crime even better. <laughs> you know, it's such a strange thing. Um, but, but you know, the other thing that I like to point out to people when they criticize Bitcoin, say, you know, when, when they point out all those failures is it's not really about Bitcoin, right? It's about people searching for alternatives to a monopoly on currency, right? To a monopoly on banking, you know, the Federal Reserve and all that. It has a stranglehold on currency. And, you know, if you want to compete, it's it's really, it's illegal to compete like with Federal Reserve notes, you know, and try to try to like make them look like that. But, you know, but other things, I think Bitcoin and, and like even like, um, you know, how some places have, um, what do you call that? Um, like Ithaca hours or mountain hours, you know, I forget what's that called. Just alter yes, alternative yes. currencies, right? Just a local currency. Yeah. Local, yeah. local currencies. Right. Um, yeah, that's fine. I think, I think they're, they're fine with it. The, the way they say it, they're fine. If it doesn't look too much like a federal reserve note. Right. But, um, but yeah, so basically they and you can't call it a dollar <laughs> and you can't call it a dollar. Right. So, so, the, so they may, yeah, they, I mean, Liberty dollar homeboys in jail, I think still for, you know, cause he used the words Liberty dollar on his coins. Is that is that the guy that used the silver dollars, so silver coins? Yeah, he made silver ounces, right. and the the name of them was Liberty Dollar. It had the word dollar, and right. you know, if if you're not using their terminology, it's kind of how the USDA organic they copyrighted the word organic, and so mm -hmm. now you have to find you know a workaround to use other terminology to say. I don't spray my stuff with pesticides mm -hmm. um, and I, I use natural fertilizers, but I don't want to pay for to use the word organic. You know, it's mm -hmm. like we have to go around their words and come up with new ways. And, it, you know, in a way, I used to think, man, they're holding us back with this kind of stuff. But really, I think they're pushing us forward because when they try to restrict our language or our um, our actions, whether it's you know through the economy or through simple things like the word organic, um, it forces us to innovate and it forces mm -hmm. us to create things like Bitcoin and it keeps us on our toes and um, doesn't allow you know um, laziness or complacency. It, it and you know the the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. I don't remember who said that Benjamin Franklin or someone, but mm -hmm. you know the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. And as soon as you let your guard down you will find that liberty exists in your life no more. Hmm. So try and oppress away because you will see me innovate, 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 and you will never catch me. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so so uh, <laughs> along those lines, can you tell us uh, um, what it's like to raise undocumented or sovereign children? Oh, it is. It's a trip. It's crazy. You know, when we were pregnant, we first found out we were pregnant. Of course, our parents were just like – you're doing what? You're doing a midwife. You're doing a birth at home. You're you're not getting a social security number. You're not doing a birth certificate. What are you doing? This is <laughs> awful, you know. And it was just this like we had to really advocate for ourselves to our peers and to our family. And, you know, so by the time we had our second kid, they realized like, okay, they had their baby at home. Nothing bad happened. In fact, it was really great. John's mom showed up. Um, she was there for both births and um, I think she really enjoyed the process because, you know, she was able to participate and witness it and um, be a big part of it. And she got to see all the, the midwives and her assistants kind of doing their thing around the house. And it was 
quiet and wonderful and intimate and um, I didn't have to get up and go anywhere. There weren't, you know, fluorescent lights and machines beeping and bopping. And um, <laughs> it was it was just a beautiful, beautiful way to bring a child into the world, just into your own home and to stay there and, and to not have that stressful first car ride where you have this extremely precious cargo that you're driving down the road at 80 miles an hour. You know, why? Why risk that mm. when you can just do it at home and not leave until you're truly ready? Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it was it was transformational, that part, um, not only for myself, um, but I think for our extended family or, you know, our, our parents, the grandparents and everyone who witnessed what we did. It was very different for for us, I know there's there's, of course, communities within our society where that's, you know, completely normalized, especially in the unschooled community. A lot of people do home birth and but it was new to us and it was new to our family. And so that was pretty transformational. And we actually documented our second child's birth and our pregnancy through a video series called Sovereign Living. And you can find the first episode for free on YouTube and then episodes one through four are on a website called watchmybit.com. And honestly, we, we didn't finish the series yet. We, we got four episodes finished. We have the taping of five and six done. But we lost our farm. Our landlord uh, decided to sell the property sort of unexpectedly and gave us 30 days to leave. And we lost all momentum on mm. finishing the series. Wow. And, you know, so if there's an angel donor out there, um, you know, all we have to do is, is finish the, the production of the last two episodes. And then we can look at Netflix and Hulu and things like that. But, um, you know, and, and then, of course, it was really depressing to even look at the footage from our life at that farm because it was – Um, It was our golden years, you know, our our daughter was born and raised there for two and a half years. And and when we lost it, it was it was a travesty. It was heartbreaking. And we had 115 chickens we had to rehome and 25 garden beds. And, um, you know, the community we had built really crumbled. It was there was a big emotional upheaval. Um, You know, John and I built this community around us. And so when we um, failed at maintaining the property because we were on a month to month lease, people were mad at us and they were resentful. And we learned a very major lesson on community building and, um, on sovereignty. And it's, it's a major reason that we now, um, have, have moved into a bus so that we can be mobile and no one can take that from us. You know, there's no landlord. Um, if we, if we're not happy where we are, we can go. And it's very liberating and very freeing, And so I definitely went through um, an evolution when my daughter was two and a half and my son was six months old. Um, Oh, gosh, I guess she was only two. Yeah, they're 18 months apart. So anyway, you know, where I used to think sovereignty was like digging roots and holding your ground and I'm going to protect my land if they come to raid us. Now I believe that sovereignty is mobility and the ability to move and go where there is more freedom is very important. And so I don't ever want to dig my heels in and have some gunfight for my land, I'm just going to go where mm-hmm. there's more freedom. I don't right. need to deal mm-hmm. with the drama of a fight. Mm-hmm. And so now we've got these two beautiful children who, um, you know, we're, we're peaceful parents. I will say since we've bought the bookstore, we've been more stressed out. So I think emotionally we've been a little bit less peaceful. We, um, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm more quick to like snap at my kids now um, but we're working on that and, and we're letting go of the stress and we're quick to apologize. And, and that's been good because now when they have moments where they're angry or mean or don't treat other kids very well, they're learning to be quick to apologize as well. And that humility and that humbleness, you were, I don't remember if we were talking about it before we started recording or early on, but how a lot of voluntarists, you have to be humble mm-hmm. because you're always challenging your beliefs. And so, Um, We try to be humble with our children, too. I think that to be a good, peaceful parent, you have to admit when you make a mistake. And that's something that I think our generation, um, our parents in general, and I'm stereotyping here, but, you know, for the people born in the 80s and the late 70s and early 90s, our parents – 
you know, it's because I said so. Mm. And they would dig their heels in. And for me, like I would try to debate with my parents logically. Well, explain to me why I'm grounded for coming in at 9.03 instead of 9 o'clock. That's ridiculous. I'm home. I'm safe. It was three minutes, you know, because I said so, because you broke the rules. And I'm like, well, that doesn't make sense to me, you yeah. know, like. And so um, for me, raising sovereign children is more of a journey in self-reflection and self-exploration and using them as mirrors to find my faults and um, and grow from that. You know, my, my children, they feel safe telling me if I'm not being kind. They also feel safe telling other people in their life, you know, like, hey, don't talk to my brother that way if it's a kid on the playground or don't push my brother. <laughs> yeah. And so... Um, you know, they, they, they call out adults, they, they call out other kids and, and they're confident and secure in speaking up for themselves. And that's because we've created a safe environment for that. And we, we self-reflect and if we screw up, we fix it. And so that's been really interesting for me. I feel like, um, raising sovereign, independent, free thinking children, has helped me to grow in a way I never could have before having children. I just simply couldn't have because you don't have that little mirror looking back at you all day. And so you can choose to shut the spark of their life out and bully your way and spank them and, and yell at them and, um, you know, be the typical American parent because I said so, or you can use them as a mirror for self-reflection and elevate into a new type of person that you wouldn't have ever become before. And so that's kind of where John and I are right now. My daughter's four years old and she, you know, she's at this point where she's um, not a baby anymore. She's a little girl and she is very strong willed and, um, but she also isn't a tyrant. You know what I mean? Mm. She's, she's well-rounded and balanced and, you know, I I believe this this stereotype that children who go to school are socialized and children who are homeschooled are unsocialized is awful. <laughs> and yeah. I think that my children are a shining example of how wrong that stereotype is. My children can speak to adults the same way they speak to other kids. They've never been forced into a room with only children the same age. You know, they view elderly folks and middle-aged folks and teenagers and little kids and babies all as their peers. And they speak to them all the same way. And they feel comfortable around all ages and all groups. And that to me is being socialized. You know, they go everywhere we go. They do everything we do. And it's, it's really amazing. And, and we've had people, you know, especially my daughter, um, her communication skills are just incredible. And, I believe that's because before we bought the bookstore, my husband worked there and she grew up listening to people debate philosophy, standing <laughs> on my hip while I'm in a group of people. And, you know, she would be looking at whoever was talking. I mean, she was listening. Uh -huh. and, and just so her language skills and her logic skills, they're very strong and they're very profound. She wasn't sitting in a classroom singing nursery rhymes. You know, <laughs> she was at a bookstore listening to debates on economics and philosophy. So um, that's not to say that we're doing it perfectly or we're doing it right. You know, we're, we're definitely on a journey and we do make a lot of mistakes. And it is really hard to raise your own children all day, every day and to run a business and to stay sane. And so we've really been focused on finding balance. And I think that the mobile life is what has allowed that for us because we have seen mountains and oceans and lakes and rivers and forests and deserts. Mm -hmm. And when things start to get stagnated or rough or whatever, we can just go. And it is so liberating for the children to experience you know, we basically kind of orbit around Austin because that's where our bookstore is unless we go on a long trip. And to realize how diverse the ecosystems are all around Austin, you know, every place we go, there's a different set of bugs and a different set of birds and a different set of plants. And so the knowledge that they are gaining from this lifestyle, mm. I believe that it defeats any education system, public, private, or homeschool. <laughs> and it is just allowing them to live their life 
as free sovereign children. That's it. <laughs> wow, so beautiful. I love it. Uh, I, I want to go back to what you said about your uh, your sovereign living series because that's how I I think I I first learned about John through um, his interview with um, uh, uh, Jeff Berwick on Anarchast, and then he talked about the sovereign living. And then I checked out the first series, the first episode, and I saw uh, how he was reading the book. Um, a uh, a is a rule is to break a is for anarchy right <laughs> i don't know if you yes, still yes, if you still yes. have that book but as a result of of watching that i bought that book and i i read it to my kids and my daughter let's see they're probably like i don't know three my son was probably three or four my daughter was probably like one around that age and uh, <laughs> and I'll read it to both of them. My son loved it and uh, and my daughter she she was barely talking but she was like she could say she couldn't say anarchy, but she says an ankiki. <laughs> so she kept saying ankiki. I want to read ankiki. <laughs> it was so oh, funny. Oh, that's so sweet. And and then yeah, I never got a chance to tell John. So I'm happy to tell you that that you know that really influenced me. And and then at the end of the book, it's like you know. Um, because this is a book about anarchy, if you want to if you want to tear this book up, feel free to tear this book up, and that's exactly what happened to it. <laughs> Eventually, my daughter <laughs> ripped, ripped all the pages out, but my kids loved it because uh, I guess you, you know you see the child, and the child is just having fun through the whole book, right? And so, <laughs> yeah, my kids absolutely love that book. Um, and we looked we looked for other, I looked for other books, but they, 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 they weren't. I don't think they were as good as that one. Um, and uh, that's the best. It's hands down the best. Right. It's, and it's the only thing I don't like in there is when they say eat cake for dinner. <laughs> all right. <laughs> because right. like I, I, you know, there, there's, there's kind of a divergence in the, um, like unschooling philosophy. Have you, you've heard of radical unschooling yeah, right, before right, right, as right. opposed to unschooling. Right. Um, so Dana Martin is the one who's really spearheaded this. She has a book called radical unschooling right. and, um, which is more than just the education. So unschooling is where children are free to learn at their own pace and their own way. And you're just facilitating learning opportunities for them and, and helping to push them along. Mm. Um, and you might hear dogs barking cause the, um, someone's showing up at this house here. Okay. Um, no but radical unschooling is when it's like, everything's a free for all. And there is this philosophy of food freedom. Hmm. And my personal opinion is when you're looking at the fluorescent colored stuff in the gas station, right. otherwise known as junk food, right, right. It, that is not food. OK, right, that's right. not food. It's right. not nutritional. It's not food. And so that's where we diverge. She says, right. don't use the word junk because it's placing judgment. You know, don't say junk food. Oh, um, really? Allow kids oh. to try whatever they want. Yeah. Oh. And I completely disagree. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like the way I see it, I'm going to buy you all the organic stuff and I'm going to teach you. Right. the way food affects you. So my daughter right. has extreme sugar sensitivities. I mean, extreme sugar sensitivities. And if I were to just say nothing and just let her do a free for all on everything she sees in the store, um, she wouldn't understand why she was having the emotional struggles she was. Mm. So instead we talk about, okay, this is processed chemical food coloring, you know, this isn't food. Mm. Um, but here's an alternative that tastes really good and it doesn't have any added sugar that makes you go, you know, do your crazy thing. And, <laughs> uh, and so we talk about it mm -hmm. and I feel comfortable saying no when I go through the gas station and my kids want that neon colored stuff. Um, I don't believe that that is being the state. I believe that that is being a true, genuine protectorate of, of creatures who um, are so young and so vulnerable mm. and who may not otherwise comprehend what they're doing. You know, you wouldn't let them eat rat poison and um, you, <laughs> we don't want them to drink fluoridated water. You know, uh -huh. you don't drink water from a river because it could make you sick. Well, that can make you sick too. And so that's an interesting little debate within the unschooling movement. And people can, you know, chew on that thought in your head, you know, mm -hmm. like, well, how free are your kids? You know, do, is it food freedom or is it not? And, right. um, you know, I, I believe in, 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 in guiding children through life with healthy choices. So we, we try to only have, you know, organic stuff that our children don't flip out on, but I, I make sure that they have stuff that, that are treats and yummy and, mm -hmm. and good. And, and so now my daughter's at a point where if we are at like a birthday party 
and there's um, a pinata or, um, you know, a, a really kind of processed cake. She'll say, no, thank you. I have sugar breakdowns. And, oh, you know, she's four years old. Wow. <laughs> and she can cool. identify, yeah, she can <laughs> identify those food triggers for her. Whereas my husband didn't figure out that he has a gluten intolerance until he was 30 years old. Mm. And, I mean, he his face, the whole time I knew him, the first five years we were together, he always had this bright red patch on his face. Mm. And it's because he was drinking beer, not, you know, with gluten in it, and he was eating food with gluten in it. And as soon as he figured out that he had a gluten intolerance, his health began to change. And so, you know, it's just an interesting debate, the food freedom thing. Mm. I, I kind of get a kick about talking about it. And, um, and, you know, I love Dana Martin and I totally support, you know, her philosophy, but I definitely diverge on the food freedom. <laughs> yeah, that's completely understandable. When it's not food. No, I completely understand. And uh, I interviewed Dana Martin. She's an amazing woman. Uh, we had a great conversation. Um, and, uh, yes, I, I think I would align myself more along your lines as well. <laughs> I, uh, you know, me and my wife, we're, we're very, um, yeah, careful with the food choices and we buy, you know, as much as possible from farmer's markets and from the health food store and from things like that and, and try to cook as much as possible. But, you know, we're, we're like, we're with, with, a like a little homeschooling group that I, uh, I get together with uh, frequently and, and, you know, we all bring food. Sometimes we cook outside, we go to different, you know, parks and, and hiking and do stuff like that. Uh, but sometimes some of the people, they bring some stuff. And it's not like ultra junk food, but, you know, stuff that we wouldn't buy. And, you know, they have it sometimes. Um, but one thing that I like to to, to, to do, like if they want to eat like, a, I don't know, a cookie or something, um, I, I, I if they really, really want it, I'm like, all right, just one. Because sometimes, you know, they take three, four, <laughs> or five. I'm like, just one. Yeah, yeah, or sometimes yeah, they yeah. say, just why don't you split it? <laughs> half for you and yeah. half, half for her. Um and and so I do it like that, and and uh, and I try to, yeah, because they, you know, they, you're right. They would binge, you know, they would just nonstop, and uh, and so and so I like I like them to feel like I'm not always saying no, like like they they shouldn't be scared that I'm just gonna say no. I'm like, all right, you can have it, but let me just give it to you in a little bowl, so you don't just have it directly out of the bag, <laughs> you know, whatever if it's chips or yes, something, yes, I don't know, yes. you know. So so yeah, I'm definitely like that, you know. I I do say no sometimes, and there's limits, but. Yeah, I mean, when when I describe this kind of stuff, I don't, yeah, I guess I should say that more because I, I usually don't mention that I do have limits. But but yeah, it's an interesting point, and I didn't really know that what you just said, like that there's this debate going on. <laughs> I didn't know that, but but yeah, I think uh, Dana Martin, she's the only one I think that I know of that is so radical as to just be even with food. You know, I didn't uh, I didn't I didn't realize that that uh, that she was you know that much, or I don't know if there's other people like that. But um, but yeah, so well there are. There are. Um, there's this really great conference called Rethinking Everything, and we're going to be going in um, September. It's this year. It's over Labor Day weekend, and it's in Alabama at a 4-H camp. It's the 20th anniversary, and this is an unschooling conference. And so all of the families there are either unschooled families or families who are curious about unschooling. Mm. And, I mean, it is just such a wonderful event. I mean, you know, I, I mentioned Pork Fest and how that was transforma transformational for me. Um, rethinking everything was transformational for our entire family. I mean, to find a group of people where, because it's this particular event has been going on for 20 years, you have grandparents, parents, and grandchildren who have been attending since the parents were three or four years old. And so it's like becoming intergenerational. Hmm. And just watching them and how they interact and the freedom of these children and how kind these children are and how unique and independent and they all are allowed to explore their passions. You know, there's, mm. there's this one little boy that I always think of who he tap dances and he'll just tap dance in the hallway. And, <laughs> and I love it. You know, that, that he, that was encouraged in him that that was something that he loved. It's right. not your typical thing for a little boy to be into. And, right. Um, it's a really amazing event and you know, there's, they have little conversations and debates about things like that within the unschool movement. And there's definitely parents that are like, you know, yeah, cotton candy and whatever you want all day, every day. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, but there's also a very health conscious aspect. And so the two kind of angles, you know, they merge and they meet and there's conversations and light bulbs go off and questions are asked and it's a very safe space to have these sorts of conversations. So if anyone out there is curious about unschooling and you would like to expose your family to a group of unschoolers, Labor Day weekend, Alabama, 20th anniversary of Rethinking Everything, rethinkingeverything.com, it is definitely worth 
the trek and they've lowered the prices this year um, because they realize you know a lot of unschool families are um, they also happen to be uh, entrepreneurs, people who are living in RVs. This is where I was really exposed to the mobile living and the people living in RVs. I hadn't really ever been around that, even, you know, in the kind of liberty anarchist community. Um, but at Rethinking Everything, the first time I went was three years ago, and it was in uh, Dallas. And then the following year was in Little Rock, Arkansas at a 4-H camp, and I was introduced to people, families living in RVs and traveling the world and using the world as their school, world schooling, road schooling, and boom, all of these changes happened in my mind and in my brain, and it was great because my son was only, let's see, it happens every year in August, and he's he's born in March, so I mean, it was, you know, he was six months old or so, and um, it was it was a really great time in my life to be exposed to these lifestyle choices <clears throat> and just meet these families. So anyone who's curious out there, I want to say it's $100 a person um, to to attend. I'm not sure if children count or not. And um, or maybe less, it might be $50 a person. Yeah, it's $50 a person. And um, I mean, it is, it's worth it. It is so worth it. I mean, it is it will change your life. Even if you don't have a family yet and you're just parents and you want to go see, or you're just a couple and you're thinking about having kids in the future and you want to see what it could be like to follow a path like this, you have to go. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have classes for adults, for children, there's belly dancing. The kids <laughs> make, um, they make boats out of um, cardboard and duct tape. And then they have a competition to see whose will float. Um, there's <laughs> hikes, there's, um, you know, there's, there's things where everyone goes around the campfire and they, um, they, they write out their goals for the next year and send them out onto the lake. I mean, there's spiritual aspects and music and, um, kind of a Ted talk opportunity where you can get up and, and give your speech of your lifetime in front of your unschool peers. So, um, it's a really cool event. And if any of your listeners are interested, rethinkingeverything.com, John and I will be there. The whole family will be there. And um, I'll be talking about leading a decentralized life. John will be talking about Freedom Cells, which is sort of small group community building from the bottom up. And um, we will, of course, be having an open house of our Bitcoin bus that we are remodeling right now. Yeah, yeah. Please uh, tell us about the, um, the Dash Across America uh, road trip that you're doing. Yeah, okay. So we were gifted the Unschool bus by Jeff and Kelly Halladorson, two Aprils ago. So we've been living in this bus for 14 months and it's been really cool. We've been able to see so many places and do so many things. And I feel so blessed to have exposed my children to the beauty of mother nature. I mean, we have parked on the beach. We have parked on rivers and lakes. I mean, it's just, it's phenomenal. And, um, but they had the house built for three teenagers and a parent with a master bedroom. And we of course have two toddlers. So, over the past year, since we also bought the bookstore, four days after we got home with the bus, we took over Brave New Book. So slowly, we kind of gutted this bus and put in our own furniture. And now we're at the point where we are scraping, sanding, and painting the outside. We're pulling out the floors. We're putting in new, um, you know, cupboards and um, appliances and um, electricity and piping and all that sort of stuff. And we're going on tour, which is the Dash Across America. And we are the Bitcoin.com bus. Um, Bitcoin.com just came on as the our lead sponsor of this tour. And we're going to be introducing people to all things decentralized. So cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Dash, and Ethereum, tiny house living, mobile living, freedom cells, unschooling, hmm. um, just all of these decentralized lifestyle aspects that John and I have really sort of grasped onto. Um, we believe in having a decentralized income, you know, having multiple streams of income so that you can hmm. weather any storm that comes uh, upon you. You know, we... Um, we thankfully are able to subsidize the bookstore when it's doing bad with our viral homesteading blog. You mentioned at the beginning, the homestead.guru. And this is all about going off the grid, survivalism, homesteading. And, you know, when, when the bookstore is not doing well, I laser focus on blogging and I bring money through Google ads and Amazon and 
Um, I also have a doTERRA business selling essential oils. Hmm. Um, if anyone's interested in that, I can talk to you about that. My husband is a longevity representative, so he sells, you know, energy drinks. It's our best selling product at the bookstore is Tangy Tangerine. So we've been decentralizing our income. My husband does his podcast, Sovereign BTC, and um, all of these streams of income, um, you know, help our family and it's a decentralized way. And that's how we're able to work for ourselves. If we were just doing one of those, we wouldn't make it. And so, um, and I used to write a lot for Bitcoin magazine and coin telegraph and different Bitcoin publications. And now that my kids are like in this total toddlerhood, I cannot sit down <laughs> and write about technology stuff. I can't focus, but, um, I, I am, I have got, got figured out how to write the viral, um, homesteading blogs. Cause that, just kind of comes more naturally for me, more stream of consciousness. So anyway, the decentralized lifestyle in every way, shape and form, whether it's the income, the way we're educating our children, the way we're living, um, this is what we are going on tour for this dash across America in the Bitcoin.com bus is really to just put our lives on display. We're going to do an open house of our tiny home and show people that you can do this. You can live a sovereign lifestyle and, um, it takes a long time to get there slowly, not only deprogramming your brain to think I have to go work for one job for 30 years to get a pension. You know, I have to buy one big house and live there for 30 years to sell it and, you know, or hand it down to my kids or whatever. Like you got to deprogram <laughs> right, all these right. little things. Um, and John and I have spent years deprogramming ourselves. And I think we're at a point right now where, um, putting it on display, um, could really help inspire some people to make changes in their lives. So um, we're really excited about it. We're going to be leaving Austin in one week and we are touring with Alma and Brian who are in their motor home. And we're going to be going to the Jackalope Freedom Festival in Arizona. Then we're going to be visiting the Airbits headquarters in San Diego. Then the Cheap Air headquarters in LA. And then we're going to be doing the Bitcoin meetups in Vegas and Denver, where Dish Network is, they accept Bitcoin. Um, Kansas City, uh, we're going to go to our family lake house for a couple of days because that's on the way down to rethinking everything and then back to Texas. And hmm. um, I think it's just going to be a really neat opportunity to um, spread the word about Bitcoin, unschooling, tiny home living, uh, freedom cells, everything decentralized. We're really, really excited about it. Wow. You guys are so busy. Wow. So when you, when you say tiny home living, I assume you mean living in the Bitcoin bus, right? Or, or yeah, you, or you, yeah. So, you, you also, most but you also mean the, the tiny, the ti you also mean the tiny home movement, like those little one room houses. Yes, yes. The tiny home movement is, you know, was kind of developed around um, building a house on a trailer so that mm. you could tow it behind you. Right. And I didn't want to do that. I like the idea of being able to go wherever we want without needing two separate vehicles, without having to tow and to hitch. Mm. And so the bus for us, which is our tiny home. Um, has just been phenomenal. That thing is a tank. It's not like an <laughs> RV that rides really low where you can bottom out. Uh -huh. um, you know, when Pete and Adamo were doing their Liberty on tour uh, across the country in their in their motorhome, they bottomed out on the farm I was staying on in Dripping Springs. Ooh. The bus rides so high, and it is designed to carry you know hundreds of kids, and it's extremely safe and it's solid. I mean, it is a tank on wheels, so we can go <laughs> off road. You know, we can drive through fields and pastures and down the beach and <laughs> over hills and down valleys and I mean this thing can really take a rugged terrain I wow. love it <laughs> so um, you know we, we like to do things in a non-typical way and um, our tiny home is in a bus it's not on a trailer wow yeah it's, it's so beautiful I mean I mean yeah like, I was, we, we're thinking about you know where we're going to move next you know we're in New York now we're thinking about you know New Hampshire and North Carolina and you know some people are we're mentioning uh, 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 Richmond, Virginia, where Cal Moline is. Um, so we're still thinking, or, or an RV. <clears throat> I know you guys are recommending <laughs> that we do that. Um, so we're still, yeah, still thinking about what to do. And and luckily with my wife, uh, talking about income, uh, she works, she, her company is online, so she doesn't really need a specific location to be at. She can just have a computer and a, an internet connection. She can work. So that's beautiful. Um, but yeah, I'm, you know, that's an, it's really an awesome thing with the decentralized income, like multiple streams of income that I definitely, I definitely support that. I think that's an awesome idea. 
um, because um, yeah, it's just like um, it's like your own insurance, right? You know, one thing fails, and you have a few others, right? So you're not you're not uh, you know the, it's the epitome of not putting your eggs in one basket, right? So yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. You know, John and I had that same debate. I I was in Missouri. Um, John and I had started dating, but we were traveling on the road together and we broke up for a while and I had offers to move to New Hampshire. I had offers to move to Texas. And, um, ultimately I chose central Texas because I believe even though we don't have a head count or a tally, I believe the movement is bigger and stronger, um, financially as well as emotionally. There's way less drama. Um, it's very highly professional and I'm not putting down the New Hampshire movement at all. Mm-hmm. Um, but I believe that they have to really work hard. Um, at least early on they were to advocate, come here, come here, come here. Austin, there's no come here movement. People mm-hmm. just come, they just show up. Right. Um, and, and there are so many Liberty businesses. There's so many work opportunities and there's a year round growing season. So I I ended up here, but honestly, I've almost been here seven years and I'm kind of burnt out on it. I want to experience the rest of the world and at least the rest of our country to start since we're on wheels right now. (laughs) And so this has been a really cool opportunity for us. Um, You know, on our Bitcoin trips, we've been able to go to Asheville. We've been able to go to New Hampshire. And so I think our goal long time, long term is to start buying very small plots, plots of land in central Texas, on the coast, on the beach, in New Hampshire, in Asheville, so that we have RV hookups in all of these places where we can go and we can slowly but surely, you know, build our own earthen eco homes in those spots so we can show up and and have a home that, you know, is um, an earthen home that doesn't, it's off the grid and um, just have an extremely decentralized lifestyle And I think the simplicity of the way we're living is going to allow that. And we've really tapped into this abundance mindset lately. Um, Mm -hmm. Honestly, we were feeling really defeated. The bookstore was really struggling and my grandmother died. And, you know, I was sitting there by her side at hospice um, the day before she passed. And I was reflecting on how I missed two Christmases in a row because we were working so hard with the bookstore the first year to buy it. And then the second year because we, we were operating it. And I was like, what am I doing? You know, why am I doing this? Why am I slaving away for a business? And we came home and there was just this massive shift. And it was like, we are remodeling our house. We are going on tour. We are no longer going to live in poverty. Hmm. And and that was something I really had to break out of. You know, when I was an early activist, it was a shift for me to come out of working for United Parcel Service. I was a supervisor there and, um, you know, with, with the corporate, the dress code, the time clock, the, mm. you know, checklist, the, the OSHA compliance, the, you know, all of that stuff um, to, I want to be a volunteer. I want to live a life of service. And that was great while I was living off my 401k. Mm. But when that ran out, I was still in this, I want to live in poverty mindset. I want to be an agorist and I'm going to struggle and I'm going to struggle and I'm going to struggle. And the past year I started reflecting on that and realizing I made that choice, that choice of poverty, because I thought that that was how I could change the world. But you don't change the world by by being without. You change the world through abundance hmm. and by being able to attract and manifest whatever you need, wherever you go, and to make choices in your life. That is freedom. And so <laughs> my grandmother passing, it, it just it, – it changed me. And I will tell you, the past month – we have tapped into this abundance mindset and we are no longer going to live in poverty. We are no longer going to live a life of stress and, and, and hitting the grind and workaholicism and, um, you know, short tempers and, and, and fear. We were in fear. It's, we're going to lose this business and so many people are depending on it. It's a community space. You know, it's, we pay an exorbitant amount of rent to have a event space to give free education and to have a radio studio to give free radio media and podcast podcast. And if we just wanted to be a retail business, we would be fine. But we're not just a retail business. We're a community service. Mm -hmm. And as long as I was seeing it through the eyes of fear and this idea that we have to save this for the community or it's going to be gone and it's going to be our fault and everyone's going to be so mad at us. As soon as we tapped into this idea of one, it's okay to fail. You know, that is okay. That's completely okay. But, But two, we don't have to. We don't have to. And we reached out and we told the world we're struggling. This model isn't working. And people reached out and the universe met us where we were and the resources were manifested into our life. And it took us 
crawling out of the basement, the bookstores underground, where we were living in fear and we were afraid and we were working every minute of every day to pop in our head out and saying, hey, we can't do this alone. And as soon as we stepped into that, we, and, and not to mention we, we fired all the toxic people that were bringing negative energy to the space, we mm -hmm. said no more. No more of this. You know, we, we try to help people. We've got this desire to help people. But sometimes you just need to say no and, and, and draw strong boundaries, which I think is something the liberty movement needs to do. Toxic people suck. And you are not free when you are emotionally abused by people. And, and so I know there's this whole like Christopher Cantwell, like – I'm going to say whatever I want and be really mean. Well, that's not freedom. It's not. You can rewire someone's brain by the words and the energy that you direct at them. Mm -hmm. And so when you are allowing that into your space, when you're allowing people who are toxic into your most intimate space, your business, your family, your relationships, you become that and you cannot succeed. And so we cut out all the toxicity. We told the world we needed help and boom, abundance. It's there. And I'm not letting go of that. I am not going to live in fear anymore. I'm not going to live in poverty anymore. I am going to change the world and I'm going to do it by helping others step into abundance. We don't have to let the gangster banksters be the only people who have resources. Mm. They're there. You just have to open yourself to it and quit living in doubt and fear. Beautiful. Man, you're making me sweat. <laughs> <laughs> I love the I love the passion. Very beautiful, <laughs> so beautiful. I love it. Yeah, well, I mean, th that's where we are right now. You know, I mean, I that's it. literally the transformation that we're going through. And you know, there's all these volunteers here helping us remodel our bus, and it's you know over 100 degrees some days, and it's really hot. Mm. And I mean, this is us blooming into butterflies. You know, <laughs> we were in this tight cocoon where we were living in fear, right. and you know, watch us for the next year. It's going to be so different. You are going to see an entirely new John, an entirely new cat, an entirely new blush family, an entirely yeah. new brave new books <laughs> because we're shedding those old toxic fear-based ways and we are becoming what I believe every human being was born to be, which is an abundant, powerful, universally um, powerful person who can do anything. I mean, honestly, you can do whatever you want. You want like, see, so here's what we were doing. We were trying to make the bookstore fund our dream life. And when I realized, because Alma Summer looked me in the face through, you know, the telephone because she's in Arizona and she said, you don't have to live like this. You don't have to be a slave to the bookstore. And when I realized that my dream life can fund the bookstore because the bookstore is my activism, the bookstore is my community service and my dream life of traveling and you know, which, meeting people and talking to Bitcoin meetups and, and, and teaching people and learning from people and community. And that's my dream life, taking my kids to the beach. That can fund the bookstore. And when I flipped that around from the bookstore needs to fund my dream life to my dream life can fund the bookstore, <laughs> everything changed. Wow. <laughs> Wow, yeah, that is definitely a different mindset, and uh, yeah, that 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 just highlights the importance of how powerful the having the proper perspective can be, and uh, and I think yes. I think so few people are or so few people have the courage to to make those kind of changes. You know, it's it's easy to to stay in a rut and and stay in the old way of thinking, but sometimes you really have to reexamine where you are and say, you know, is this is this way of life you know, improving me and my family or is it, um, you know, like you said, bringing negative energy and anger and frustration into our lives and um, and we don't need that, you know, we, our, our lives are short, you know, and, um, and I think, you know, we, we're destined for much more than this. So I, I think, and I think that's, that's something that, you know, our family is also kind of, my, me and my wife kind of struggling with since um, we, you know, we, we sold our condo in 2014 and then, and then we moved um, back to, uh, you know where my family is and and so I haven't been working and just my wife's working so she's all stressed out you know but um, but I think when we move you know um, it's so important to either either have the RV and just you know go mobile or just move in a place that's much much you know lower 
um, lower cost of living. But but what's awesome is her income is online, so that that really doesn't change. You know, people are like, well, well, if it's lower cost of living, then you know you're gonna get a job and you're gonna get less money as well. I'm like, well, she works online, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, truly, it is. You know, we would not have survived owning the bookstore for 14 months if we lived in a house in Austin. We wouldn't have been able to. Mm. You know, campgrounds around here run from 300 to 600 dollars a month, but half the time, like right now. There are people who own farms and they say, come stay with us for three months. Come stay with us for six months. Wow. And that has been really neat for us. I think cool. that time period, that like three to six month time period in one place, it allows you to really get to know another family. Mm -hmm. It allows you to really get to know that region and that area. But it also allows people to keep their autonomy and to move on and, you know, ramble on. Mm -hmm. And so for us doing the tiny home thing, the mobile living, the RV thing, um, you know, right now our personal expenses are electricity for a bus. So, you know, it's nothing. Um, our cell phone bill, our insurance and, um, food. And, and that's, that's our cost of living. Mm. And so when you tell that to someone who's living the standard American lifestyle, they can't even fathom it. <laughs> you know, they can't even fathom it because there are so many bills that come with the standard American home and the American dream, mm. you know, that, and really, isn't this the American dream, the ability to head West, you know, with your family and in search <laughs> of gold or whatever, the promised land, you know, like to me, this is the American dream. This is freedom. I love it. I am. I feel so blessed to have gone to rethinking everything, to have met these people who live this way, to, I posted on Facebook, here, here's the power of manifestation and the law of attraction and this idea that when you put out to the universe what you want, that you will be met with that in return. I posted on Facebook a year and a half ago, can someone tell me what it's like to live in an RV with a family? And by the end of that Facebook thread, we had been gifted our home. Wow. Okay. Really? <laughs> so yeah, literally that, that was how it happened. Wow. So if this is something you're even remotely interested in, try it for a year and you will find how liberating it is. Hmm. I mean, this idea that like we can take on a struggling bookstore that we can take on these entrepreneurial things and they can fail because our living expenses are so low. It takes such a burden off of our shoulders. I mean, just a huge burden off of our shoulders. Hmm. Wow, so beautiful. So before we go, I don't want to keep you too much uh, longer, but can you tell us a little bit about your stateless marriage and, and how that went? Yeah, absolutely. So my husband, John, and I, we got pregnant well before we were married. Um, we had our daughter uh, home birth. We, you know, we were working through some of our own, you know, kind of emotional things during that time. And we fell even more deeply in love. And my husband proposed to me at the Porcupine Freedom Festival in front of about 400 people. <laughs> and um, we decided to deliberately conceive our second child on the train on the way home. And it was great. <laughs> and um, we had our children 18 months apart, um, very intentionally so that they could go through puberty together. We want to have children in pairs. Oh. So that they've got a partner to kind of grow up with. And, sure. um, you know, so the next next time we get pregnant, there'll be another one shortly following deliberately. <laughs> and um, we we had a year and a half long engagement and um, we got married as a family. You know, my father didn't walk down the aisle and give me away. I don't belong to him. We walked as a family and we yeah. walked down the aisle and we we did some ceremonies that I didn't really even look up what other weddings were like. You know, we just decided what we wanted to do and some rituals that were important to us. We had a tree planted by every single person who attended the wedding. They put dirt into the pot and um, you know, I was barefoot cause that's just the kind of hippie girl that I am. And, um, <laughs> we had acoustic, um, Beatles music playing through the entire thing. And our friends got up and said some words to us. And we had, um, we had the people in attendance give vows to us as well, that they would be there for us, that if we needed them and, you know, honestly, the pressure of the bookstore, we almost called our wedding attendees together to help us because we were we were crashing and burning and living in fear and fighting. And we thought our marriage is going to end. Hmm. And so we were that close to calling our wedding party together to follow up on their vows to be there for us when we needed them. And we found a way to plow through without needing to do that. And um, it was it was a community wedding. It was um, us committing to each other to be better people, to stick together, to work through it, to make it happen. 
and um, asking our peers to be there for us and to help us. And if we needed them, whether it's for emotional support, like I just mentioned, or if it's, you know, um, barn raising, like we're doing with, with the, um, the house that we're remodeling right now in the bus, um, you know, we reached out, we asked them to be there and it was a camping festival. <laughs> so we all camped out and there was a bonfire and it was on a lake. Um, there was a little small church there. We're both spiritual. Um, you know, I, I walk with Christ and Buddha and all the great teachers of the past. And so does John. And um, it was just the most wonderful weekend of maybe not the most wonderful weekend of my life. But one of them it was in the top 10. It was <laughs> it was really great and very unique. Um, there was no state involved. We had one of our good friends was the wedding officiant. And, um, you know, honestly, we didn't we didn't even sign a contract. Our our wedding was videotaped for Sovereign Living. So it will be um, in the final episode. Um, episode five is um, the birth of our child. And our our wedding, I think, is in episode six or episode four is the birth of our child. And the natural health is episode five. And the natural six is our stateless wedding. Mm -hmm. And um it, it was awesome. And so technically we're not quote unquote legally married. Although I think in Texas we're kind of grandfathered in through common law marriage. Um, but, um, you know, I don't need permission. I don't need to file anything with anyone, um, to be married, to have a family unit, to have a life partner. And this is a choice that we made and we don't want a third party involved. So should we decide to split that's between John and I, and we do have a, if we break up, you know, here's what's going to happen contract that we've signed with each other. Um, you know, one about the bus, one about the kids, one about the business. Um, you, you know, we have created those documents for our, for each other, but they're not filed with any state or governing agency. It's a private handwritten document between us as sovereign individuals. Wow. So beautiful. Wow. See, I love that. <laughs> you guys are paving your own way. P true pioneers in the, in the in the truest sense of the word. Very cool. So, um, <laughs> so please, before we go, um, let people know how they can reach you if they want to find your work and uh, help support you. Yeah, I think that the easiest way, honestly, is on Facebook. You can find me, Catherine Bleich, B-L-E-I-S-H. And, um, you know, I'm always posting from Instagram what we're doing at the moment. So if you're following me on Facebook, you're going to see how to learn about the bus. You're going to see how to learn about the bookstore. You're going to see John's podcast. You're going to see, you know, the local media I just interviewed John last week. So you'll see links to that. You'll see um, everything we're doing is, you know, kind of funneled through both of our Facebook accounts. So John Bush, um, Catherine Bleich, we are the Blush family. And you can follow us each independently um, and, and, you know, walk with us on this journey. We love learning from other people. We love um, being exposed to new thoughts and new ideas. And that's a really great forum for us at this time. Um, and of course, the homestead.guru is our viral marketing blog. Sovereign BTC is John's Bitcoin podcast. And um, yeah, we look we look forward to seeing everyone on the tour. So um, please hit us up and I'll be posting the tour dates very shortly um, in the next like 48 hours um, on the homestead guru. So you can see if if you can come to one of our events. Wonderful. Yeah. So was, I'm so happy we were able to get, do this interview. We've been trying for such a long time and <laughs> you're a busy lady. You got you both are busy doing some awesome stuff. So. Really happy we really happy we made it happen. Uh, so if anybody wants to help me out, um, you can do so through um, through Bitcoin, Patreon, or PayPal. Uh, Patreon.com slash Peaceful Anarchism to help me out. Dollar Show is all I ask uh, for interviewing wonderful people like Catherine here. I love to do it, and I would love to do more. And uh, monetary compensation is always appreciated and encouraged, right? We're capitalists in the end. We respond to incentives. So, <laughs> so please, this is, right. I, I offer free content. This is all free. Um, but as we know, uh, in economics, uh, there's always opportunity cost. Nothing is actually free. If we're doing something, we're not doing something else, right, at a cost. So, so uh, please, if you enjoy You need to put your RV on your Patreon as a perk, you know? If enough people support you with enough per month, there's your RV. <laughs> you can take off on the road, and your wife doesn't have to stress about funding it. 
See that? Another awesome suggestion. We will <laughs> we will take that into consideration. <laughs> Thank you so much. I love I love these ideas. I will I will definitely run these by <laughs> Monica, and we're gonna talk about this stuff. We have <laughs> we have much to talk about with uh, with planning our uh, future mobile life. <laughs> so very exciting. I'm I'm, I'm excited. Um, so yeah. So you can also help me out by um, uh, using the links on my on my uh, on my fa- fa- uh, website, which is uh, the Amazon affiliate links. And make your purchases through those, and uh, you, I get a small commission at no extra cost to you. And this helps me uh, do what I love doing best, which is interviewing fascinating people like uh, Catherine here. So um, awesome conversation, Catherine. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much for coming on the show. Um, so this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network, on theconsciousresistance.com, and theseedsofliberty.com. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government-controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.